I'm sure at some point in time in your life you've heard the term, women don't have friends, they have frenemies. And this refers to the rather fractious nature of interpersonal friendships and relationships that exist between women. And increasingly there's been research, at least in the academic sphere, to demonstrate that women are not just peaceful, harmonious creatures that they're often purported to be, certainly in mainstream media, and as a rule in the general perception of the public. It's a consistent myth that you'll hear again and again. So I want to talk about some research that's been done recently to show how women sabotage each other in the right circumstances, and to further elaborate on the notion and nature of the so-called sisterhood. Because the sisterhood is largely a myth. Where it does work, and I've talked about this before, is at scale. Between masses and masses of women who do not know each other, who are unfamiliar with each other, who will never meet each other. So when one talks about women in an abstract sense, women as a collective, then there's a sisterhood. For example, if they want to pass legislation for admitting a certain number of women into jobs in a certain state, or they want universities to have more women in them, then it's good. Women as a collective, as an undefined mass of people, that's okay. And of course, women at the individual level acknowledge and realize that they can benefit from just that kind of arrangement. But at the individual personal level, there's absolutely no sisterhood. It's been well documented by many people, above all evolutionary psychologists, that human female friendships are very, very unstable compared to male ones. They tend to fracture much more easily. They require a lot more maintenance, attention, and care, if you will. And so that's not exactly a recipe for reliable, consistent, and persistent friendship and cooperation. So a student in Australia, Ms. Williams, pursued research exploring how intrasexual competition between women works and basically how they operate at that level. And although the results aren't shocking, I want to offer some instances of how women do not support each other. Because yes, female competition is just as vicious as male competition. It's just not as visceral or visible, and therefore people tend to ignore it. Remember, women are overall more subtle, and they work from behind the scenes. It doesn't mean they're doing nothing, especially true when it comes to manipulation and underhandedness. So I'm going to read some of these off. In the third study, I explored how women sabotage hypothetical hairdressing clients through disingenuous beauty advice, which would detrimentally impact the client's physical attractiveness. Both lay women and female professional hairdressers cut most hair off women who were of the same attractiveness level as them. They sabotage women whose hair was in good condition and had requested a smaller amount cut off to a greater extent than women with hair in poor condition. Client makeup caused lower mate value, lay women, to cut off less hair, suggesting the dominance decided by women wearing makeup resulted in reduced sabotage. More intrasexually competitive women, including hairdressers, cut off more hair, confirming competitor manipulation as an intrasexual competitive strategy being employed. And this one's a little bit more mild. It's another example. There are several. I'll be linking the study in the description if you're interested. The final study explored conspicuous consumption as a female competitive strategy using women's spending on non-essential items in two different scenarios in preparation for a women-only social event to be hosted in their homes and at a charity function. In the first scenario, high intrasexual competitiveness resulted in an increase in spending on all three items, the kitchen, the outfit, and makeup. Women between 35 and 45 years of age spent more if they had children, but the sexes of the children did not make a difference. In the second study, giving to a charity increased with intrasexual competitiveness, perception of judgment by the women around them, and whether there was an audience. Women were compelled to buy more tickets when the women around them spent more. We explain these findings in terms of manipulative consumption in which wealthier women seek to deplete the resources of rivals. So shockingly, or not too shockingly, it turns out that women don't necessarily like each other very much. And I think ultimately this serves the unfortunate purpose of creating much more volatile relationships and friendships. Not to say that relationships or friendships between men can't be volatile or have their problems, they can. It's just a lot less likely than what happens with women. Because women by their nature 
are much more fearful of disapproval. They're much more tuned into harmonious coexistence. And therefore, little fissures, little things like that can serve to fracture that. And then you end up with fights and nothing good at all. And I'm always forced to recall this article I covered probably 10 years ago now about a woman who started an all female company because she thought that'd be a great idea, no more men to interfere. And it turned into a drama show, basically. It turned into a soap opera. The women bickering, fighting. There was a man who came in to fix something. They all fawned over him and fought over him. They were basically all drama queens. And the woman CEO who initially started the company came to the conclusion afterwards that henceforth she would work with as few women as possible. And we also see this, of course, in the phenomenon of women not enjoying having female bosses because that's a status thing. Between women, other women are not allowed to have higher status. It's, it's okay if a man has higher status because they're working in different categories. They're not directly competing with each other. But of course, the thing that annoys me the most is that it's very easy to engage in misandry in today's day and age. It's very easy to write books like David Buss, perhaps the most famous of evolutionary psychologists out there, about so-called psychotic men, the title being Bad Men, The Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment, and Assault. Now, the problem with this title, of course, is it's sensationalist and implies that most men are like that. Now, the author will assure you later on that it's only a small percentage of men who pursue these behaviors, and it's true, but that's not how you get people interested in the book. You need to be sensationalist and exaggerate. And I've said this repeatedly. We never see books such as Bad Women, The Hidden Roots of Social Manipulation and Backstabbing or something like that which is something that goes on routinely between women, but you're not going to really hear about that. And if you were to hear about that, it would have to be a woman who wrote about it. And it probably would be written in a way so as to not denigrate women too much, not make them seem terrible. You can say whatever you want about men, probably these days, and get away with it. And a guy like David Buss, who, you know, respect for his research and what he's done for the field, and he's just exploiting the misandric nature of our current social setting to make a buck, to be perfectly honest, which is fair enough. A lot of people do that. I do wonder, though, at times, who, at least in my case, live to see a time when you can openly talk about the negative traits of women as we can very openly talk about the negative traits of men. And I have my doubts. But I think as more and more of this type of research is done, specifically when women do it, because in order to be able to talk about negative aspects of female behavior, you kind of need to be a woman, lest you be assigned the title of misogynist, and at least if you're in the mainstream or you're in academia, that's not really an option, then yeah, more and more of the stuff gets done. Hopefully in time, it becomes a level playing field. But even if that were to change, do I think that's gonna change the general lay of the landscape? change the world to a place where we show both men and women equal compassion? No, no, I really, really doubt that. I don't think that's going to happen. But it is what it is. At least some research along these lines is being done. And, and it shatters the myth of the female sisterhood. It simply doesn't exist. But in any event, I want to thank everyone for tuning in as always. And special thanks to my patrons. You guys are the best. You keep the channel going as well as the donors on PayPal. Also fantastic, guys. Really appreciate you. And if you can engage in the usual YouTube jazz of liking the video, sharing the video, commenting, subscribing, it'd be much appreciated. And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out next time. Until then, may the gods watch over you. Take care. Bye-bye. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.